Okay, so let's get started, guys, and um, let's uh, first start with the review. Uh, vocab words from 7 to 12. Okay, we finished 1 to 6, um, and today we're going to work with 7 to 12, and the first word here is potential, uh, rendition, malignity, procured, idle, and emboldened. Okay, uh, let's start with the word potential. All right, I've saved time and I already uh, listed here the uh, synonym and the antonym for each word. Okay, so the first word that we're going to use or we're going to work at on is the word potential. All right. And uh, here potential is from uh, encounter, an encounter from, uh, sorry, uh, the Spider-Man behind Spider-Man. All right, this is what uh, I believe this is where the story, uh, the word come, came from. All right, so if we can have our books open, and I'm going to try one second to open up um, uh, the book with you. So we can get these definitions together from the text. Okay, so let me share screen with you now. If you have your textbooks open to the Spider-Man behind Spider-Man, you will you'll be able to see that this is our definition on this page and it's the word potential. Okay, so any volunteers to help me with the word potential? Okay, Reem, please go ahead. What does what is what is the definition for potential here? Uh the ability to grow uh, and develop. Great. Okay. So if we see potential in someone, we see that they have the ability to grow and develop. That means uh, they have, they are, you know, they they have a perspective future, okay? Or they, it's, it's something perspective. That means that we see that it could possibly have great outcomes, okay? So here, um, the definition of potential, again, that we saw here, the ability to grow or develop. All right, and again, uh, we see that potential is what part of speech, um, uh, Reem? Noun. It is a noun, okay, so potential is a noun. A synonym for potential, again, is perspective, and the antonym would be unpromising, okay? So if someone has an unpromising future, that means it's not a future that is uh, basically filled with, um, you know, uh, positive things, okay, or potential. All right, so unpromising is the antonym okay Reem, if we look at the picture uh here which of these would you say uh is more of uh potential where do we see potential here um in which image the first one i thought the purple one right the purple one right you feel like they're growing right they're like this these people have potential because we see here marked with the ability of growth okay symbolism for it is the staircase we see that uh each one is taking the hand of the other Okay, until they reach the uh, the top. Okay, so this is the idea of a growth. Okay, or growing or having potential. All right. So here again, uh, let me just yes. resize. Yes. Miss Hall, can't it be the one that says mot motivation? Uh, no, because that would be emboldened. We're gonna see that later. Okay, and uh, here this uh, is not motivation. Uh, potential has nothing to do with the act of motivating. All right, potential is just the recognition of recognizing that somebody could can possibly have a bright future. Okay, that's uh, away from uh, motivating them or away from uh, you pushing them. You're not doing anything, just, uh, you know, you recognize that this person has potential. And um, we can, you can always remember the story uh, that we read in grade seven with thank you, ma'am. And the big question was potential. All right, Mrs. Jones, uh, she didn't punish the, the young boy that stole her purse because she saw that he had potential, all right? And that means that she recognized that even though or despite that he did something negative as stealing her purse, uh, that there was something good in him or she saw that he had some somehow a promising future, okay? So that is potential. So potential uh, is different than motivation, okay? It's, uh, it's they're two separate acts, okay? Him, can you please um, uh, answer the, uh, put potential for us in a sentence? Uh, yes, uh, I saw potential in my friend and decided to help her. Oh, good. Okay, I saw potential in my friend and decided to maybe guide her. All right, so you recognize that your your friend had a promising future or a prospective future, and you decided to guide her. All right, great job, Yareem. All right, the next word that we have here, thanks, Yareem. All right, the next one here is the word rendition. Okay, and um, it's also 
uh, from uh, the same story. All right, and we're going to see the word rendition. Maybe a little bit more down, which is right here. Okay, and uh, let's, uh, can Hannah, can you please help me with it? What is the definition of rendition? Um, it is a pictorial representation and interpret interpretation good okay a picture representation or something okay so rendition all right again if you look here and get the part of speech also hannah okay uh right. now perfect great all right so we have your rendition all right and rendition is a picture pictorial or an image okay representation all right um and uh here we, it's a noun all right, so a picture, uh, a picture, a picture, or uh, basically an illustration. All right, that's usually uh, like computerized or something like that of of an image or of an object or an item is a rendition. All right, uh, here we saw the word rendition when they discussed when they were looking for Spider Man. Um, uh, they uh, 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 they were able to develop a rendition or a picture image, a computerized picture representation of what. Uh, or how they want the spider to look like with the colors and you know how it should look okay and it was Stephen Kutcher's job to find or to find a, a close uh, uh, you know replica of this uh, picture presentation all right and uh, they the, you know he had to kind of like play with the with the spider remember by painting it and so on to match the image that was uh, illustrated or this picture, this picture representation, or this rendition of the spider. Okay, so basically, a rendition is a noun. It's a thing, and it's a uh, computerized image of any item or any object. And another word for it would be a presentation. There is no antonym for this word. Okay, so we do not need to um, learn any antonyms for this word. Uh, we can just, you know, focus on either a sentence or a synonym. All right, this word, this word would not have an antonym in our uh, on our exam okay and you're not obligated you're not you know obligated to know an antonym for this word okay by looking here at the images hannah can we kind of like sort out uh, uh what would be a rendition um the picture of the spider right it looks like a computerized image okay of the spider and it fits the the description that i just gave you of the computerized image of that uh, stephen kutcher had to uh, abide with all right, this is the, uh, the computerized image. So here we can get, can you put it in a sentence for us? You can even use the Stephen Kutcher example. Uh, can I use another one? Yes, of course. Uh, for example, the teacher showed us uh, a, rend a rendition to explain to us the story. Yes, okay, the teacher showed us a rendition to help us visualize the events of the story. All right, so a rendition here is a picture, okay, that therefore is going to help you visualize, all right? An image of, or a computerized image that's developed of something, all right? Thank you, Hannah, perfect. Okay, the next word that we have here with us uh, is uh, malignity, all right? And here we are uh, starting to study the animal form words, okay? Fadia, can you help me with malignity? Uh, evil in nature. Exactly. Okay. And malignity were the words that we saw for the quiz. Okay. Uh, so we should know. Uh, we should know them. All right. Malignity. All right. And malignity. We said. Say that again. Evil in nature. Evil in nature. That's correct. And what is the it's, part of speech uh, of malignity? Uh, adjective. Malignity is not. Or no, it's not an adjective. It's a uh, the idea of being evil in nature. Hate, no. violence, it's a noun, exactly. It's the idea of the evil in nature, it's, it's a noun. All right, we're gonna use the synonym malice, okay, malice, and we're going to use the antonym of benevolence. Okay, benevolence means kindness, all right? So here we're gonna add just the word kindness, which shows that it's the opposite of malice or malignity, which is evil, uh, hate, uh, something that has to do with negative feelings, all right? Where is our picture of malignity, Fadia? Uh, the one, wait, the one, uh, the, the devil, this one. Right, the devilish looking uh, object, okay, which is, you know, symbolic for, as we can see here, 
uh, uh, for some type of evil, uh, evil behavior or evil nature. All right. Uh, how could you use malignity for us in a sentence, Fadia? Yes, I use it as the the in the, the one for the novel or like uh, any anything other. you want, anything, whatever way you want, it's fine with me. Uh, the malignity of my boss uh, was for adding more tasks on me. Okay, all right. So we can say um, the malignity of. Oh, okay. The malignity of being um, of of my boss showed when he added ta uh, tasks on me. Okay, when he added harsh tasks upon his workers. Okay, all right. So here uh, again, here his evil nature showed when he added these harsh tasks upon his workers. Okay. Great. Okay, good. Good one. All right. The next word that we have here on the list is the word procured. Okay. And who's going to help me to do that one? Judy. Okay. Procured. Okay. What does it mean? And it's the past um, tense. So the word here, the base word would be procure or procure, procured. It's the same. Uh, to obtain something, especially with care or effort. Okay. All right. So to obtain something. All right, to obtain it, to purchase it, uh, to, you know, this is all the same. And what is the part of speech? It's a verb. It's a verb, correct. Okay, which is to obtain. So it's a verb. Uh, the synonym that we're going to use is going to be the word acquire. Acquire, okay, which means to gain something or to obtain something. The antonym would be to throw it away or to give it up. All right, we saw this word in animal form when we discussed that Napoleon, uh, um, who was making a decision that they needed to procure items from outside, all right, things that the farm was not able to produce on their own, on its own, and they needed to procure it or to obtain it or to get it, okay, from or to acquire it from outside, all right? So here, uh, looking at the picture, which image shows that you are procuring? The one with the visa? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this person here is uh, with a shopping cart and a wallet uh, pulling out the visa. Uh, uh, to procure or to purchase, okay, or to own something, all right? So she is procuring, definitely, all right? And how could we use it in a sentence, please, Judy? Um, the students procured uh, some dec a few decorations for the Christmas competition. Okay, the students procured a few decorations or ornaments for... Okay, so here, um, all right, the students procured a few ornaments or decorations for decorating the classroom. All right, so that means you basically purchased or, pos or, or possessed or obtained, acquired, all these are fine. And the opposite is to give away, all right, which is the opposite of basically gaining, you're giving up, all right, which is the antonym. Okay, so thank you so much, Ajudi. Okay, Luji, Luji Ayman, please, uh, let's look at the next word. We have the word idle, okay, idle. All right, so uh, let's excuse me, let's put it right here. And what is your definition, Judy, for the word idle? Uh, avoiding work or being unproductive. Perfect. Unproductive. Avoiding work and being unproductive. That's correct. All right, and what is the part of speech? Uh, adjective. It is an adjective. Perfect. All right, and the synonyms that we need to know, Judy, will uh, would be inactive. All right, someone who's inactive is idle, not being productive, as you stated. And the antonym would be someone who's diligent, okay, like boxer, okay. In, um, in animal form, we would see that the pigs are more of the idle animals, all right. And uh, a boxer would be a good example of a diligent worker, okay, someone who is very giving and very productive. All right, so here, uh, um, out of the two left images, which one would be idle? Um, the one in, in the right, they have to come yeah, right. The one in the, in the right, facing the computer, right? The, the workers, okay? And what do we notice about them? They're sitting here. Uh, Luji, can you explain how does this picture show idleness? Uh, 
uh, okay. Um, uh, my um, my best friend is idle, stays mason in bed for most of the day. Good. All right. My. Okay, I criticize. my best friend for being idle and staying in bed for most of her day all right and here do we see that these employees are being idle they're all sleeping all right she this woman is you know make, painting her nails and they have a pile of work lined up and they're just you know napping or so on uh, uh, here also might criticize my best friend for being idle. Okay, she's not doing anything, but she's staying in bed all day. All right, so that is perfect sentence. Uh, good job, Yaluj. All right, and the last word that we have for today from our seven, uh, six words is the word emboldened. All right, and it comes from the word bold. All right, uh, emboldened. All right, and uh, let's see here. Um, let's hear, okay, Ahmed, please. All right, emboldened. What is the definition for emboldened? Uh, to encourage. To encourage, bravo. All right, to encourage someone means to embolden them. All right, to, uh, to give them a push forward. And what is the a part of speech here, Ahmed? A verb. Perfect. Okay, and the synonym that we have is to reassure someone. And the opposite would be to dishearten them. If I'm going to dishearten Ahmed from, taking, from going on that trip, I'm not going to push him forward. I'm going to make him actually uh, reconsider going on the trip. I'm going to discourage him. All right, but to reassure him, I'm, I'm going to motivate him. I'm going to embolden him to take that step and go on that trip. All right, and of course, Ahmed, the, the last picture here is uh, the one that says motivation, the man carrying the, the motivation sign, and that is the one, the only one left. And Ahmed, can you use the word emboldened in a sentence for us? Uh, my friends emboldened me uh, to present my project. Okay, so present my project yes. in front of a wide audience. Okay, so in front of this wide audience, you might be a little bit uh, timid or embarrassed to give a presentation, but Ahmed says that his friends emboldened him or motivated him to present despite the fact that he's going to face a wide range of audience. Okay, so he needs a little bit of motivation. Okay, perfect. Okay, so again, potential. All right, to see that there's some uh, promising future or something, someone that holds a promising future or something positive in the future. A rendition is a image that is uh, uh, presented like a, a computerized image that is uh, uh, developed through uh, and uh, as a presentation or uh, malignity, uh, evil, hate, violence. All these are negative things to procure, to obtain or to gain or to possess or to acquire. Uh, um, idle is someone who is inactive and to embolden, again, to give a push forward or to motivate, okay? And these are our uh, answers. I already saved them here, so let me just click the save button uh, to save the rest of them. And uh, I'm going to stop the share for a second, and uh, I'm going to post the answers on SMS, and I'm going to post from the yesterday and today uh, from 1 to 12. I'm going to upload them on uh, Facebook as we uh, stated. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to go over before we um, finish or before we do anything or get into anything is Animal Farm. We still had a chapter 10, the remaining of chapter 10 to, uh, to discuss. All right, and that would be right here. We stopped at the part where uh, we were discussing the idea of uh, Squealer. What did Squealer do with the sheep? He took a, a group of sheep and uh, Nano, can you remind us what did he do with this group of sheep? Took him out of the farm to make him to make them learn a new song. Great, and we learned that the the new song. What was it that he made them? All in. Um. Right here. I can't remember the yeah. Right here. Four legs, good. Two legs, good. Exactly. Okay. All right. So here again, and why do you suspect that he made it or changed it to two legs better? Why did he change it to two legs better? Because he's going to change a commandment for them to move on two legs like humans. Yeah, because the pigs actually are going to start moving on two legs like humans. Exactly. And we saw that actually happen. So remember, 
um, I might ask you, what did Clover see that made her panic? And don't forget, don't get confused between Benjamin panicking and Clover panicking, okay? So Clover panicking was because she saw uh, uh, the sight is, is of the, uh, uh, of first it was Squealer, and then there was a line of pigs coming out of the farmhouse. They took a little uh, a walk around the yard, and they were all standing on two legs. They were walking on their hind legs, just like humans, all right? And this sight, of course, it made them, uh, uh, it made them feel like, you know, like something is definitely, it's an uneasy fe a feeling of unease, and they thought that it was time for them to protest. Okay, and we saw that uh, they were about to uh, think of words of protesting and then who or what happened that kind of like ruined the moment for them. Okay, so they were uttering, they were about to utter words of protesting, but what happened or what took place that made them stop Hannah? Um, the, the sheep uh, started to yell uh, four legs good, two legs better, which exactly. was the sound that they uh, made them memorize. Exactly. Okay. The bleeding of the, whore, the the sheep that was used from Napoleon's day to distract, to cause chaos, and to kind of like change the subject and so on was always the bleeding of the sheep. Now they're bleeding uh, four legs good, two legs better to match the idea of the pigs now basically standing on two legs. All right, or walking on two legs like humans. And of course, uh, by the time that they finished, they kept going for five minutes. By the time they, they finished, the, the pigs had already returned back uh, or marched back into the farmhouse and the animals did not utter or say any words of protesting, okay? Uh, we see here, and then we're gonna continue. We're gonna, we're gonna start right here in this uh, paragraph. All right, let me get the highlighter. All right, Benjamin. All right, we're going to start right here. Benjamin looked around and, of course, he sees Clover, uh, uh, her old eyes. Okay, remember, she had roomy eyes, and roomy is one of the vocab words that we're going to see later, which means watery and moist, okay, uh, showing old age and showing that she's her eyesight is not the same. All right, and she tells Clover um, that she cannot see or read these commandments, all right? Uh, she said that, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, that this is... My sight is failing. And even when I was young, I could not have read what was written there. Okay, remember, she wasn't that educated. She always uh, went to Benjamin to do the reading. Benjamin always refused to do the reading. And it was always Mural that read for them. But Mural is dead. Okay, because we have now, we're, we're advanced in the novel for many, many years uh, ahead, okay, of when the revolution first took place. And a lot of the animals that used to live on Animal Farm and witnessed the revolution, they're now gone. All right, and uh, she, uh, let's remember these quote, this quote of even when I was young, I could not have read what was written here. This is said by Clover, all right? And here uh, we see that Benjamin is going to uh, agree, all right, uh, uh, consented to break his rule. What was his rule? His rule was to basically um, not read, all right? And he, he always refused to read for them. He only uh, read for them the sign when he said fool, fools, uh, uh, and he read for them what was written on the uh, um, the van that was taking Boxer away. And we see that he read here the second time. Uh, now that all the commandments on the wall were erased. Okay, no more commandments of animal animalism is now simply vanished. It's gone. All right, there's only a single commandment or one commandment that is written. And this is it. All animals are equal but some animals are more equal than others, which of course is the complete and total opposite of the essential rules of animalism or communism, where all animals were supposed to be created equal. Okay, so here we see that definitely we're at the end of the, ch of, of the novel almost, because again here, the whole point of George Orwell was to show us what? To show us that how gradually all right, and how, um, um, you know, over time, uh, uh, communism was, unfor you know, unfortunate to them. They thought that, you know, this was going to be uh, the way that Karl Marx advised them to live a fair life where everyone is treated equally and, um, and so on, uh, where the social classes, the poor was not really taken advantage of and living very poorly while the rich remained rich 
and very wealthy. All right, and this is the social gap that we're seeing now back in Animal Farm. However, here we're seeing it with the pigs, one of their own people, all right, which as Joseph Stalin, as he promised uh, uh, his people, the public uh, or the citizens of Russia at the time that he was going to uh, uh, abide by the rules of communism and follow uh, uh, the theory of Karl Marx, which is again, communism. And however, we saw that over time, uh, this didn't occur. Why? Because people take advantage of power. When power is not supervised, okay, uh, and people are ignorant and they don't question and they are readily to believe anything that they're told, uh, this is what happened, all right? Abuse of power. And we saw the abuse of power started with the, uh, with Napoleon and the pigs and so on, okay? Uh, after that, we saw that uh, the pigs, all right, uh, who were supervising the work, which is very also um, scary, uh, we see that they carried whips in their trotters. And we said the trotters are the little um, hands, or I would say the hoofs looking like things uh, that the pigs have. So now we see that animals are, uh, or the pigs are now carrying uh, these whips, all right, which were a sign of enslaving, uh, all right, or a sign of slavery, as the pigs described it in the beginning. All right, so now the pigs are holding on to these whips um, while their uh, comrades are working. Okay, so here we see that there is no equality. All right, and they were basically going back to uh, to Mr. Jones's times, except now the uh, their dictator is not Mr. Jones. It's it's another. It's it's one of their their own people. All right, so here we see that uh, the animals. Okay, the pigs are starting to behave very much like humans. All right, they had taken out subscriptions, okay, to magazines such as John Bull, Tidbits, The Daily Mirror, okay. Uh, Napoleon was uh, uh, starting to smoke a pipe, okay, uh, smoking, all right, tobacco, all right, in his mouth. He even started to wear Mr. Jones's clothes, all right. Um, Napoleon also himself appeared in a black coat, a rat, catch, a rat catcher uh, breeches, and leather leggings. All right, this is the outfit that he was wearing that he borrowed it from Mr. Jones's closet. All right, and his favorite so, or the fa uh, you know maybe his his wife or so on, uh, 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 she appeared in a watered silk dress that she wore from Mrs. Jones. Remember, here we see that Napoleon is uh, the father of thirty-one pigs, so we see that he has some type of relationships with uh, maybe the pigs, the female pigs on the farm. Okay, so he had given or even dressed up one of the female pigs uh, in also a silk dress, all right, uh, suggesting again that the pigs are now closer to humans. They're no longer really pigs, okay? Uh, the next ending here is very, very, very important for the exam. Uh, um, we need to learn that, uh, um, Mr., uh, that Napoleon invites a group of farmers, okay, Pilkington and uh, uh, Frederick, to come over to the farm for a inspection, okay? And to, of course, make peace, okay? We understand that over the, uh, over the chapters, we saw that Napoleon's relationship with Frederick wasn't so good, and then it, um, it turned out to be that he was actually good with Frederick, but then he turned his back on Pilkington. Uh, there were some differences and, uh, um, you know, rumors that were spreading about, uh, you know, them keeping snowball and so on. Or what the or what kind of uh, uh, um, violent behavior Frederick was conducting against his animals? All these things you guys need to remember for the exam. Okay, so we need to understand well uh, how their relationship was with these uh, with these people uh, uh, with Frederick and Pilkington previously, and of course the whole idea with the timber. All right, with selling the timber and who did he end up selling the timber to and so on. All right, so please keep note of that when studying for the exam. All right, so here uh, they come for a tour or an inspection of the farm. And during that time, uh, of course, the animals were surprised, all right? Uh, they were uh, basically given a tour of Animal Farm, all right, these humans that came, all right, they were given a tour of Animal Farm and they uh, expressed great admiration for everything they saw uh, from the windmill and uh, the animals were working very diligently, okay? Diligently is one of our uh, antonyms for the opposite of idle. So here we see that the animals were working very hard. Not, not one animal even raised his face from the ground. All right, uh, here we see a sense of, um, again, 
the animals are kind of like broken, all right? They don't even, they're too afraid to even look up uh, uh, and they were frightened of the pigs. They do not, did not know whether to be frightened from the pigs or the human visitors, all right? This is George Orwell's way of saying that the pigs are human. Humans are now becoming one, all right? That the animals are no longer uh, people, you know, the animals on the farm, they're no longer, uh, you know, able to tell who to be afraid of. Should they fear the humans or should they fear the pigs? Again, uh, showing this is his idea or his wording to show that the pigs and the humans are becoming one. All right. Uh, so um, after the inspection was done, we see that the um, the, the pigs took the humans. All right. Uh, uh, Pilkington, Fre uh, Frederick and his, their men, and they took them into the farmhouse. OK, uh, to basically and the animals heard a lot of laughter. All right. A lot of laughter coming from the farmhouse. And uh, the animals wondered, okay, what is happening on? What is happening? All right. Why are the animals and the human beings meeting in terms of equality? How come a Napoleon and the pigs are meeting with Frederick and Pilkington and their men in the farmhouse? And there is a lot of laughter and singing, okay, uh, as if, you know, we are on good terms. All right. Uh, of course, the animals decided to creep. Okay. Creep means to walk slowly to the farmhouse garden to take a peek or to gay, uh, to take a look, a little peek or take a look into the window to see what's happening, okay? So Clover led them, okay, Clover, the old horse, led them uh, and they tiptoed, all right, all the way to the farmhouse and they took a little peering into the dining room window, all right? So they looked into the dining room window to see uh, the surprising sight of uh, the animals all right, um, maybe a half a dozen, all right, of farmers, all right, a half a dozen means six, remember a dozen is 12, all right, so a half a dozen of farmers and a half a dozen of eminent pigs, all right, eminent means well-known and respected pigs, Napoleon himself was sitting at the seat of honor, all right, at the head of the table, all right, which is like the head of the, the table, all right, and uh, they were all sitting together, all right, and the pigs appeared uh, um, you know, at ease. Okay, the pigs were very happy with this with this company. So six men and six pigs are sitting at a dining room table, and at the head of the table is Napoleon. The pigs are very happy, uh, and they they seem. And what were they doing? We need to remember that they were uh, playing a game of cards. Okay, they were playing a game of of cards. All right. So they stopped breaking. Uh, they stopped playing cards for a moment so that they could have a toast. Okay. A toast to drink a toast uh, and I, I think I um, let me see here uh, to show you um, to um, drinking a toast this is what it looks like all right you know when you make a toast I guess maybe you don't all right um, this is this is how it looks like okay to to drink to, to make a toast okay we're all holding a cup of, of, of you know of wine or so on and we're gonna make a toast and before they make this toast we're gonna see two different speeches all right and I uploaded for you guys today a chapter 10 a study guide uh, here, a very, very important question. I, I cannot stress how important it is to uh, be able to differentiate the speech given by Pilkington versus the speech that was given by Napoleon, all right, before the toast, okay? Or we're going to call it their to reconcile their differences. And remember, uh, reconcile is the opposite of, I think it's one of your words or maybe grade seven, I'm getting confused. But anyway, to reconcile means to uh, make peace. All right. So again, this, during this meeting, uh, they're all sitting in the farmhouse and they're about to, they're, they're each Pilkington is going to give a speech uh, before the toast, right? Before the toast. And Napoleon is going to give also one speech. So the question here says uh, uh, to tell the difference. All right. What is the message of each speech? All right. The message or the main message, you can, uh, we can write them in bullets, uh, paragraph format, as long as you can be able to summarize the message of each speech. All right, this is one important question. I would, uh, if you know, I would definitely highlight it uh, in my book. And uh, also when I'm studying, I would pay close attention to answering it well uh, in my study guide. All right, so um, here, before they, uh, they give this, uh, before they have this toast, um, uh, there's a jug of beer that's circulating. All right, so they're all drinking beer together. And before they have this toast, we see that Mr. Pilkington from Foxwood uh, stood up and he says that he has some words, 
okay, he wants to share a few words, all right? And uh, it's very incumbent upon him to say, that means very mandatory, very important that he says these words. Okay, so we're gonna see now, uh, this is his speech, all right? Uh, and of course here, he has some ending remarks. All right, this is his speech. All right, these two paragraphs are very important because they sum up his speech or how significant his speech was. All right, uh, it was a source of great satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure to all others present to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had now come to an end. So now he's pointing out that finally him uh, or his farm, Mr. Pilkington and Foxwood, are going to become now a friend friends with Animal Farm, that the period of mistrust and misunderstanding is going to end, okay? He reminds them uh, that there was a time where uh, uh, they treated each other with, hostil with hostility, okay? And uh, they were not such good neighbors, okay? Uh, unfortunate in incidents had occurred, all right? Mistaken ideas had been current, all right? So we have less than a minute. We're going to join back up again to finish revision of these presentations uh, uh, given by Mr. Pilkington. And then we're gonna look at Napoleon's and then we're going to uh, start revising grammar. So have your grammar workbooks ready as well, please. Okay, so let's join back up now with our new meeting. Okay guys, I'll see you shortly.